Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, really interesting session here today, looking at the outlook for the second half of uh, of the year. Um, super panel. Um, as ever, um, we're here live, which means that you can ask your questions and make your comments. Um, so on the right hand side, you've got a QA and a button there and a comment button. So please do use that um, and I'll be monitoring those um, just to make sure that we answer all of your questions. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Richard Betts um, and I'm the, uh, the, the publisher at Real Asset Media and we run around 60 of these events a year. Um, obviously before we were meeting you in person and now we're meeting you online. Um, super panel here. Um, so let's let's start with introductions. We've got Marcus Sielebeck, um, SML Alami, um, Jessica Hardman, Philip Lapierre, Irina Politschuk and, and Andy Watson. Um, really interesting, really interesting group here. Um, let's let's just start with you, um, Jessica, just with a with a quick introduction of, of yourself and DWS. Great, thanks for uh, having me here, Richard, this morning. Yep, so I um, head up UK, uh, European uh, Portfolio Management uh, for DWS. So DWS is a large global asset manager. So we're investing in real estate uh, in Europe and then also U U uh, US and Asia as well. And we're running diversified core fund strategies as well as uh, core and value add uh, separate accounts for a mixture of German and international clients. So looking forward to bringing our well thoughts to this conversation about what's interesting around the sectors and the economy today. Great, thanks very much. Um, Andy, just a quick introduction of yourself and, and Europa. Hi, good morning everybody. Um, Europa Capital are a boutique investment manager, pan-European. We have a 25-year track record mainly in the value-add space and that's the backbone of our business, even if we're diversifying today towards core and debt. Uh, we are majority owned by Mitsubishi Estates, listed on Tokyo Stock Exchange and one of the biggest property companies in the world with over 100 billion of assets. Uh, I am a partner of Europa and a fund manager of the core fund. And I've been living in Paris for 27 years. And although I don't sound like it, I am a French citizen as well as a UK citizen and an Australian citizen. I lived in Germany for five years before I came to Paris um, and I'm speaking to you today from our little Paris office just off the Champs-Élysées. Very good, thank you Andy. Um, Asem, over to you. Yes, uh, uh, my name is Asim Alami. I'm uh, heading the international origination of, of Berlin HIP. Berlin HIP is a balance sheet lender, a traditional fund brief lender. Um, active in uh, in Germany, of course, but also in uh, the Benelux, France, Poland, and the Czech Republic. Uh, our um, loan portfolio stands at around 25 billion euros, and uh, um, I'm based in in Berlin. I'm less less fancy uh, in in uh, central Berlin, and uh, not so close to Champs Elysees. <laughs> Great, thanks, Asim. Um, Philip, over to you. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Philip Lapierre from the Thal Investment. I'm the CEO and CIO uh, for the European business. Lafal is a 100% daughter company of JLL, listed at the New York Stock Exchange. We manage about 80 billion of AUM globally, uh, with businesses in Asia, Americas, and in Europe, uh, which I am uh, honored to run uh, here from Munich today. Um, we manage, uh, we are fully focused on real estate. We manage everything straight through the risk profile. So from core to core plus to value add to opportunistic, um, depending on sectors, there's a stronger way towards value add. In Europe, our business is more core core plus, but we are building out our uh, value add business as we speak. Uh, in particular, growth has been our big open-ended funds, uh, Encore and Eregi, but also uh, Amy Asnar's business around uh, financing. So the whole debt side of our business has grown extremely well over the past 10 years. Uh, so it's a wide variety um, and we approach the market from every angle, almost regionally. So greetings from Munich and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Great, thanks very much, Philip. Um, Irina, just a quick introduction of yourself and InRev. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here, Richard. Um, my name is Irina Polipchuk. I'm Director of Research and Market Information at InRev. InRev is pan-European non-listed real estate industry body and really our key aim is to 
increase transparency, promote standardization and uh, guidelines for the non-listed real estate as an asset class. We cater for both um, investors and fund managers and are developing tools to better understand, measure and analyze the non-listed real estate and therefore to help um, imp uh, you know, empower uh, the investment decision maker and inform the market. Great, thanks very much. And last but very much not least, um, Marcus, a quick introduction of yourself and, and Patricia. And uh, congratulations on having the best background so far that I've had over the last 60. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm working for Patricia. We are an independent investment manager focusing on, on the real estate and emerging into real assets now with a, let's say, strong European background with the first investments also on a global scale. Uh, Again, like most of, of the participants from the investment side, a core and value add focus, but also emerging into opportunistic. And myself, I'm with the organization for, I would say, roughly a dozen years now in different roles in investment strategy and research, focusing on market developments, developing strategies, as we are very much analytically driven for, for the product development processes. Great, super. Thanks very much, Marcus. Um, obviously, the, the focus this morning is going to be looking at the, uh, you know, the outlook for, for Europe, also picking up some of those global themes. Um, but it's interesting to start out, I guess, on how we characterise the first half of 2021. Um, so, Andy, I, I just wanted to come to you just to get your mm -hmm. kind of perceptions, I suppose, on how you how you're seeing um, the sort of first half of 2021. Did it mostly confirm your views or were there surprises? Um, what's, how do you see it? What's your sense of that? So I think the first six months may be notable for what didn't happen and what didn't happen was disaster. There was no meltdown. Um, I was listening to Irina and an INREV seminar last week and somebody noted that the core index has seen three successive quarters of capital growth. Um, rent collections are not as nearly as bad as was thought and just look at the stock exchanges as a barometer of economic health. They're in good shape and Philip's parents, JLL, their shares are over $200. And um, that's a proxy for the global health of the property business. Uh, maybe as an as an add on to to this, I think the the big surprise was possibly that increasingly people realize that it it is not the typical recession as everybody talked about last year, but nobody really believed in. And we now realize that it it is really a different type of crisis given that that's a demand led politically led issue and not so much of a financial or other other driven driven events i think that is one of the big surprises that it now materializes and possibly that 2020 wasn't that bad economic wise as everybody expected when looking at the forecast in the second half of last year i think that's interesting um and just in terms of some of those sort of macroeconomic factors there that you mentioned. Um, Asim, what's your sense, I suppose, in, in terms of some of those, you know, looking at interest rates, those kinds of things, and the economy? Um, do you agree with Marcus there that there was less impact than you were expecting? What's your take on it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, a, a year ago, we were preparing for the worst with uh, sort of building nuclear shelters and, and all this uh, stuff in, in terms of financial stability of the uh, of the of the banking sector and uh, luckily all of this was was not really necessary and uh, we're now looking at a good year 2020 and uh, for speaking for Berlin hip we're looking at a very good year 2021 so far um, which is uh, which is quite surprising and, and sort of uh, you know uh, puzzled us as all. But if we look at the macroeconomic uh, uh, figures, we see that, uh, with the exception of the UK, maybe that all of the um, if, if you if you take 2021, 20, 22, and you take it uh, um, including a uh, forecast, of course, then you'll probably end up with a normal growth of uh, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 uh, percent uh, GBP growth. Um, uh, at an average, so which which uh, um, 
underpins what has just been said by Marcus and, and, and Andy, actually. So we're, we're, as a lender, we, we feel quite comfortable. We, we, we saw that um, owners of properties, our clients, uh, were uh, taking reasonable action. We saw that uh, tenants were, in most cases, uh, reasonable, not always, <laughs> and uh, uh, that uh, the things uh, were quite smoothened out, helped, of course, by very low interest rates. And I, I think that's, that's, that was the key issue here, that nobody really got under, under pressure on, on the financial side. Um, and Jessica, um Asem there mentioned the sort of difference between UK and Europe. You're obviously based there in London. Um, what's what's your sense of that? Um, you know, I guess in terms of the the last six months, but also looking forward, how are you seeing the UK? And I suppose the comparison with uh, with continental Europe. Yeah, from a real estate perspective, obviously UK is dominated by its London market, and that has always been a high international market. So I think the continued uh, restrictions around travel haven't helped that market to really, um, uh, you know, have any sort of bounce back yet from an investment perspective. But I do see that actually on the horizon. Um, you know, just talking to uh, connections within the market on the brokerage side, there is definitely renewed interest now coming through into the London markets. Um, and I think once, uh, you know, travel is opened up a little bit more, we will actually see a bit more dynamic activity. Um, the one thing that UK has in its slight advantage is the vaccination rate is obviously significantly higher, and and by the end of uh, summer we should see the you know the majority, if not all, of adults who choose to take the vaccine um, to have it by then. And and I certainly notice here in Ealing that there's a real local push for for vaccines over 18 year olds, and I think that will be a you know a real sea change um, for the UK to be able to open up its corridors. I agree with you with continental Europe. Um, maybe a little less of the sort of um, the impact has been on, on the graphs. So let's say um, that London is very categorised right ups and downs on the graphs. And, and I think continental Europe is less categorised by that. Maybe it's rent review provisions or whatever. Um, but I've seen a more stable um, discussion around continental Europe. But like I said, I think uh, towards the end of this year and, and next, we'll start to see UK really drive forward both economically and, and, and filtering through to the real estate markets as well. Um, and um, Philip, you're obviously seeing a, a, what's happening a lot with the international capital movement, you know, US, Asia capital. Um, has there been a difference in terms of perception of, of Europe? Do things like the, the vaccine rates make a, make a difference? Has that really been cutting through or not? I think that's been less the case. Uh, I pick up on Jessica's point. Travel has delayed some of the investment capabilities of the international capital sources, um, even though... There have been clients that have found a workaround not to be able to visit the building. So a lot of the European capital, uh, sorry, the, the the Korean capital has, you know, taken advantage of service providers to have the site visits uh, to keep investing. I think the first six months, it was a standstill, uh, but that tempo has sped up. Uh, and in particular for London. So I think we, ha we are seeing the beginning of a bounce back in London. If I look at our own investment strategies, I do see... We've got the most offers out in London yeah, through the risk stack, both into developments and uh, in the core side of uh, core side of life, because uh, the yield spread is there. Uh, the stability of UK over the longer, you know, the midterm, I think, uh, is quite attractive. That yield spread is quite attractive, but the vaccination rates look. We're, it's a global topic. Let's not forget that. It doesn't matter if one country is faster than the other. Uh, the benefit for the UK at the moment, they still can't travel. So it's not even, you know, it's not an add-on. Uh, there is no, no, uh, there's a comfort for the population, which is great. Uh, there's a movement forward, but I think Europe or the world is in this together. Um, and if you want international capital flows, those vaccination rates have to go up, uh, you know, at equal levels um, for that capital to flow freely. But in general, you know, I do have to agree with, with Andy. For the first half year, the non-disaster has been interesting. But I'm sure we'll get onto it. Underneath that, uh, there are accelerators in our industry that are going to change the way that we invest and what we invest into, and uh, which product types will be the ones for the um, for the future. That's interesting, um, and uh, and we'll definitely pick pick that up, Philip. Mm -hmm. um, and Irina, just just coming to you, you're obviously there um, within Rev, also looking across the the capital and the investors. Um, you know, judging on changes of mood, beginning to get that coming through. What are you seeing in terms of investor intentions? 
Um, well, I think first and foremost, uh, I think I would like to echo everything that's been said so far. I, th I think we definitely see signs on normalization and there's a lot of uh, assurance in the data coming through, uh, be it on the uh, performance or so the third consecutive quarter uh, of positive performance, but also capital value growth is positive, which means investors are uh, regaining their confidence. Uh, we've seen a significant decline in uh, use of material uncertainty clause in valuations from about 56 to 57 percent in Q1 2020 to now about 18 to 21 percent in the last couple of quarters. So again, some certainty in terms of uh, where the valuations are at. Um, and I think there is general um, you know, recovery across the market, even in the UK, is already coming through because we had a third positive quarter in terms of total performance in the UK, albeit from a very low uh, base. Um, so uh, the big picture is positive. I think from the investor intentions, uh, but also from the big picture results uh, from the fund manager survey as well, um, I think there is a bit of uh, comfort to be taken where we are as an industry. Um, I think first and foremost, it shows clearly in the results that uh, some lessons have been learned uh, from the global financial crisis, particularly when it comes to exposure to debt. So if you look at um, INREV pan-European fund index, as it stands, the average gearing is about 23 to 24%. Now, if you compare that to pre-financial crisis, that stood at well above 40%. So I think that's where some of the stress is also um, not coming through into the market. Uh, we are also seeing a very significant shift uh, to kind of risk off since the global financial um, crisis. And uh, the amount of dry powder, and that's probably the, the number that did surprise me, uh, just how robust it is, but uh, the latest results suggest that 9.3% in dry powder as percentage of global assets under management in terms of capital raised and yet to be deployed. So again, confirming a healthy capacity to invest for our industry. Great. Um, yeah, really interesting to see that that amount of capital waiting on the sidelines. Um, and I, I want to talk a bit about the opportunities, but first let's let's just pick up on some of the challenges. Um, Jessica, in terms of you know you as a business when you're looking forward, what are you seeing as the as I suppose the, the kind of key challenges really? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things there, really. One, we have uh, through the last 18 months and probably was a feature that there was there before the pandemic, but has been strengthened by the pandemic is the polarisation around sector. So we're seeing a lot of capital really coming into the residential sector, into the logistics sector, whilst investors um, and advisors wait to understand the impacts on the office sector and retail sector was already um, you know, dealing with its own sectorial issues. And so when there is that polarization and there's no more room to, to put that capital, you'll see a strengthening of pricing um, and uh, in that could obviously fuel more supply. And so then how, where does that sector go in terms of delivering the returns it's meant to in, in say a diversified strategy? So we run a, an open ended core fund Europe too, and uh, that has early on taken a position around residential and logistics. And I'm pleased we did because we've seen you know, a compressing pricing um, ever since that fund was launched three years ago. So that's, that's sort of one topic and we might dig, dig a bit more into the sectorial exposure. And I guess the other one, of course, and we will all agree in this, I'm sure is the rise of ESG, we manage that within our portfolios. Um, and how do we you know, select assets that are going to be future proofed going forward, especially when you're at the core end of the market and you're investing in assets that are going to yield your return and your income over multiple years, over 10 years plus. And so how do I choose assets now? Or how can I retrofit assets that are going to give me that longevity? And so I think that's a very big topic that the industry is facing as well. Okay, a couple of couple of big topics there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> let's let's just just pick up a little bit. I mean, Andy, in terms of that that challenge around the the differences, you know, the, the rise in terms of residential and logistics, and how you manage to balance the portfolios. Um, I, I suppose does that create different opportunities for you? Or, you know, how are you seeing that? 
Yes, I mean, our experience echoes what Jessica just said. Um, we have tilted our stock selection in the core fund that I run towards residential logistics, a couple of things that Europa knew how to do pre-COVID, and that's gone well. Uh, we're outperforming the index very healthily, but actually in terms of building a diversified fund where there's a question mark on offices for core, that's not so straightforward in my previous experiences of building core funds now would be around about the moment to put in a hundred million fully let shopping center and diversify but right now in a core fund our risk adjusted returns there probably mm -hmm. not maybe in the next 12 months so uh, the problems for us as fund managers is that logistics is quite small and granular stuff so in terms of building mass then uh, that's a challenge. Okay, good. Um, and I want to pick up a couple of things around the, the sectors, um, but also just, Marcus, given that you are urban chief economist, a um, lot of discussion about whether or not people are going to be moving out of the cities, um, you know, what's going to happen to cities, is it going to be gateway cities, is it going to be regional cities, um, what's your take on that? Yeah, thanks Richard. I think we have to, to look at what is the perception after, let's say, 12, 18 months and also at the experience we had looking at the first lockdown or the first lockdown phase last spring and looking now after seven months into a second larger lockdown with the second and third wave in many countries, we realized that mobile working work from home can be a substitute but only an imperfect substitute for physical meetings and and for office use and i think also we have to see which jobs can move to a suburb <coughs> location which people are able to commute and which which are not so i think fundamentally looking also at history and how cities have emerged it, the city is always the focal point of economic activity it was created for interaction, for creating, let's say, economies of scope and whatever. And that is something that will not change. We are living in, in, in the, in the, in the service-oriented economies that deal a lot with interaction with people and also where innovation is created with in, interaction. So I think ultimately the city will gain attraction again and we will see people moving back to the offices, but the offices might be different and maybe not everybody has to be in the central office, especially if you look at the big cities like Paris and London, there might be additional hubs emerging on the fringes so people will not commute to the city center every day, but they will have an exchange and they will be flexible, possibly working mobile uh, from different locations, but ultimately they need a room to, to work again because also we all working from a home office or most of us are now also dialed in from a home office. Uh, not everybody has the, the luxury to really make this a, a place that where you will continuously be able to work. Interesting. Um, and uh, Philip, from, from your perspective, is I mean, you mentioned there that there was an adjustment in terms of some of the strategies going forward. Um, is that the case when you're looking at cities? Is it gateway cities? Is it regional cities? Are, are you... Are you, you know, either buying into that argument or beginning to adjust because of it? Um, there, there's so much to unpack of all the comments from my three speakers. So let me let me let me try to take a take a more holistic approach. So I, look, like everybody else on this call, logistics and sheds, beds, and meds has been has been the center of attention for us as well, and we've deployed quite a bit of capital over the past eighteen months in those sectors. But let's also be honest, the return on those investments are hitting a, a level that are becoming more and more challenging and they're not accretive to our fund performance. And if you're buying logistics at three or below three, a residential sub three, uh, even office, we're selling something in Paris that's still trading well under three. Uh, so all that pricing pressure and that continued pricing pressure um, you know, you need to get creative of what the alternatives are. Um, and that alternative space will either be the re return of hotels, uh, the return of, uh, of retail, and the most difficult one will be offices. Now, I and let's focus on the office piece because it's such a nice little debate because we all don't know what's going to happen. We all don't know how we're going to work. So it's open for any kind of, in uh, for, for any kind of uh, uh, interpretation. Now, my view, uh, 
uh, it's very different to to Marcus's because I don't think it's going to be either home or a hub or an HQ. I do not believe in this hub creation, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, because you're really then tearing the fabric apart. What do you want in an office? You want people to come together to have that conversation. If you give them alternative spots there as well, you're never going to have that creation coming back. And we're seeing how challenging it is to, to motivate people to come back to the office and to really play into that game. And it's the people that drive and it's critical mass in the office that drive the acceptance of office again. If you tear that apart and you have the ability to work anywhere, you're never going to get that educational, that, that corporate culture, all those strands of elements that make an office useful. The work part is a very different discussion. You can work from anywhere. But your corporate culture, your work, your collaboration, your creativeness, your your better together principles can only be created in an office. And yes, it's unlikely that we'll go back to five days. So pressure on demand for offices will continue. Now, thankfully in Europe, we're coming from a very low vacancy. So that immediate reduction of demand is unlikely to really have the rents tank. But there will be continued pressure, sideways movements of it, and maybe the top rents will will ease back a little. The more interesting question will be, and that's picking up on Jessica's point, is ESG, which locations and which type of buildings, and hence why stock picking in the office sector will become absolutely critical going forward. What do you put in in CapEx? How do you look at these buildings? And how do you tap into that bifurcation of tenant demand moving forward? That really is the office, uh, this, um, the office discussion that you need to look at. And I think there's value. Throw on top of that the fact that most fund managers would like to reduce their office exposure. There's quite a bit of movement from all sides in that in in that sector, which I think is a really interesting one to play in. Yeah, and then we'll get on to retail because I think there's there's uh, that's an interesting discussion as well as we move forward. Because again, it's the city, and if you don't believe in the office world, then you don't believe in the city world, and then retail becomes a real challenge within those segments uh, within those cities as well. Yeah, lots, lots, lots to pick up from there for sure. Um, I'm, I'm just going to briefly, briefly pick up. Um, Asim, obviously, from the financing side, it would be interesting to get your take on your view on this and, and also whether or not that's making a difference in terms of financing decisions, in terms of the financing strategy. Um, and also just just pick up a little bit for us um, how you see the outlook for financing, um, you know, going forward over the next six to 12 months. Yeah, maybe uh, a first remark on, on how we see the different asset types. Actually, um, real estate for us uh, is, uh, is a long-term business and uh, we don't believe in, in in revolutions in real estate. I've been in real estate for 25 years and I haven't seen a single revolution anywhere. You know, after 9-11, we talked about uh, the end of high-rise office towers. We're still in, in, in the 30-something floor and then we're paying horrendous uh, rents. So, you know, the, 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 I, I don't think that the, the world after COVID will be, um, will be a little bit different than before COVID, but not uh, in, a, in a revolutionary way. So having said this, we um, we continue our, our risk strategy the way that we uh, that was it before. We see that there there will be a little bit of erosion in office demand. We will, we we still think that the the retail uh, has some structural challenges which were existing before, which were a bit accentuated by the COVID crisis. Uh, we we are still fan of, of logistics, but think uh, that the prices paid today are are, are crazy. <laughs> to be honest, sometimes when we talk about uh, uh, yields of uh, of around three percent, um, it takes a lot of fantasy to to see uh, how uh, money is is, is uh, um, earned with with that kind of investment. But you know, we we're just the lenders. We just uh, lend. Uh, 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 safe and stupid money, and and, and uh, we're happy in, in, in that sense. So, um, in in terms of lending um, <coughs> environments, as long as we don't have a stress on the on the system, we, we and we do have some challenges. We'll we'll get there, I think, uh, in a moment. Um, the the lenders will be quite uh, uh, ready to 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 provide funding. Um, Berlin Hip is is open for business and. Uh, Quite, quite, uh, quite active in the market, and and I don't think I don't see any particular um, competitor to to be you know to be pulling back or pulling out of the the market. Um, 
if if they don't have any any more structural uh, challenges that has nothing nothing to do with the macroeconomic environment. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to come to you in a second as well in terms of um, in terms of that sustainability side as well, Asem. But um, I just wanted to pick up. Um, Irina, from from your perspective, are you getting views within Inrev about the sustainability side? Philip's already talked about it there, and and Jessica, you know, are we going to end up with a situation where that becomes the absolute key thing, and then you've got you've got those that those assets that I suppose um, do have the right credentials and the rest. Uh, well, I think we are already there <laughs> because if you speak to many investors and when they you know, go out uh, to choose the fund that they would like to invest into, the ESG is very much at the top of their agenda. Uh, and, you know, if the ESG box is not ticked, uh, you know, further due diligence might not uh, progress. So I think we're already there. I think the tricky part is kind of linking it and quantifying it and understanding what impact the ESG has on the performance. And I think that's really uh, difficult to convey and uh, difficult to uh, put the numbers to. Uh, one way of thinking about is to what extent are the current variations actually able to, with the current methods, able to capture the value of um, ESG compliance. And I think that's one of the risks going forward in the marketplace that I think there might be quite a significant risk of obsolescence that we quite, can't, can't, can't uh, quite right now put a finger on, um, but it is there, it's just not qualifiable in variations. Okay, good. Um, and just, just in terms of, um, I suppose, Jessica, your, your view on that, um, does that mean from DWS's kind of point of view that you're trying to aim across the portfolio for a certain, you know, carbon neutral date? Um, and what does that mean? Does that mean that you are going to be selling off things that are obsolete or are you going to be trying to change those? I mean, how, how do you structure that as a strategy? Yeah, so, um, you know, like a lot of um, asset managers now that we have um, our 2050 target for um, decarbonisation of our portfolio, and then we obviously have a pathway to that every decade of how we try and uh, reduce our CO2 emissions. So absolutely, it's Richard, it's probably a bag of all of those actions, to be honest, there is going to be some assets, especially in a, in a market currently where there is um, highly a high value on logistics and maybe some logistics assets where you say, well, these are just going to be hard for us to turn into um, high green assets in the future. And what a great time for us to think about recycling out of those. But equally, I think it's a responsible asset manager to say that we need to also invest in existing buildings in order to upgrade them. Because, of course, say in the office sector, the grade A new shiny building is the minority of that total uh, universe. And so actually the key is that we uh, work with the assets that we already have. And, and of course you go back to then to the investment um, fundamentals. Is it a good location? Will tenants like to come here? And can I now do an upgrade of that property um, at a reasonable cost to then make a return? And actually a lot of the cases you can, that the technologies coming into retrofit offices are, are actually you know, really um, impressive. And I think over the next five to 10 years, we'll see a huge amount more developed in this area in terms of technologies and being able to um, retrofit these into existing buildings. Um, a lot of a lot of the um, say commodity stock is built in the last 10 to 25 years and actually has good bones and you can reposition it. So I think we'll do a bit of both. We want to be funding the new um, highly green assets and we also want to be working with our estate as well to make improvements. And that and that really goes hand in hand with working with our tenants as well because they're driving us, investors are driving us and tenants are driving us. But often they're saying, I really like the building. So what can we do now to work on um, you know, a, a stage upgrade of that building over the next five years? And how can we make sure that doesn't have disruption around my operations? Bearing in mind they've had an 18 month of disruption, I think they're actually very engaged tenants now to get the space right for them and we're happy to help. Okay. Maybe Richard, just to jump in here, I think what we also have to keep in mind, especially when we look at the old versus new ex upgrading existing buildings from an ESG perspective in the long term is much 
more an ecological point, a much more environmental friendly approach than just destroy, uh, destroying and build new because that creates a lot of CO2 emissions and an impact on the environment just to reconstruct. So refurbishing possibly will be a large part of the story going forward because demolish and build new might in, in some cases from a C, from an environmental perspective not be the optimal way on, on dealing with it, especially in an environment where we discuss a lot about how many space do we ultimately need in the long run. Yeah, no, I think that, Philip, you wanted to come in on that, did you? Well, no, first I'd like to agree with Jessica. Look, there's, there's a couple of elements here, and maybe first of all, the amount of questions we're getting from investors in January this year in comparison to the years before, it's a, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's massively different <laughs> to the past. Now. So COVID really has been an accelerator. So interest of clients, tenancy as well. And so the whole topic has, has been boosted through the roof. We were caught off guard, at least to the intensity of the questions coming through and the breadth of the intensity coming through. So it's really coming in from all sides. We've doubled our team size on ESG in that, in that period of time. So we're now five, almost going on to six, hiring some more. By the way, extremely challenging market to get the right people with experience uh, to hire them. Uh, which brings me to the next point is we don't quite know just yet the technological uh, component of, of improvement is going to be an interesting as well whatever you're setting on today might not be the technology that's going to survive in the long run and at the moment we're still in the position where you've got to be able to measure first measure benchmark and fulfill so all of that what we're doing is uh, uh, we're, we are actually auditing every single building of our 24 billion on the continent right now that in itself is a lot of work that project in itself is quite challenging. Tying in the right partners to do so, because they're all being asked, is quite challenging. So you got to be ahead of the curve to be able to see which buildings are obsolete, what are my measures, what is my capex. And I fully agree with Irina. The interesting one is, what's the valuation impact of this whole scenario? We don't quite know yet yeah, what that is going to be. Is it just an obsolescence? Is it a capex? Is it something I need to price into my exit as well? And the third example I'd like to give just how important the topic is for us. So we're working on all of that, uh, plus the digitization to make it possible. So increasing teams, auditing all buildings, getting a feel for the capex, then deciding which ones do we invest in, which ones don't we invest in, while we're also believing that we will, uh, what we're also doing is funding net zero carbon buildings to develop them, because we think that tenant bifurcation will lead to higher growth in those buildings in the long run, in, in particular in London. So there's a build it, there's a whole scenario. And the last thing uh, that, I, that I wanted to allude to is once you've captured all of that information, it's a lot of work to really get on top of it. And you need your tenants on board, you need to measure it. It is, it's, it's, it's not a topic that's going to go away, but it's also not the only topic. And I want to make people quite aware of it. Location still trumps ESG at this, in this situation. So you've got to take it into account, but it's not your only driving factor uh, um, as we as we progress through this but it's becoming extremely relevant it's becoming relevant on the way that your funds are actually defined so is it a category six seven eight nine or well, seven doesn't exist six eight nine um, uh, fund because that is the one that's going to attract capital because everybody wants to tick that box and one that, and they want to contribute so it's a highly interesting um, change in our environment uh, the thing goes for green loans uh, really important for us now to how to get a hold of green loans and, and all these topics that's the underlying changes of COVID that I meant it's an accelerator only it was a tendency coming and thankfully it's coming at a faster pace but it will change the way that we invest you know, and you've got to be aware of it um, and maybe for acquisitions uh, one of the biggest discussions we now have in IC is if it's not net zero carbon now what are our measures what do we have to do to the building so that is, that we have one yesterday, that was 30% of our discussion was around ESG measures. Not about what to do it or not, but it was how do we tackle the topic. And that's both climate risk and ESG. And that's really just the E and the climate risk. So we've got both those factors that we need to look at nowadays uh, that has made it a bit more complex. And in, within all that, there's some great opportunities to be found. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's a great movement, but it's that underlying change that I mentioned earlier that really makes your investment strategy and your portfolio strategy a very different one than 18 months ago. Uh, I would agree on that, Philip, but I think what we also have to understand is all what we are talking about is have, it's very much, I would say, 
also the measurement coming from the commercial segment. And if we look back at one of the favorite sectors currently, the resi part. Oh, good luck with measuring that. Privacy <laughs> issues come into account. How do we measure all these kind of environmental impacts and how can we influence tenants which at the end are free to choose and don't give us a lot of information about how they buy into their energy or whatever. So I think that's the other part where we have to learn and educate ourselves and also the investors about what are we able to do and able to influence and what are we not able to influence possibly or not even able to structure in any way. But it's doable, but it's a competitive advantage. I'm not going to talk about it today, but it is doable. <laughs> Great. Um, Asem, um, Philip also mentioned their green financing. Obviously, you know, you mentioned before that you're you know, you're looking at this over the long term, but obviously that's going to include then how you're perceiving change of use um, and those green financing sides. Absolutely. ESG, as uh, has been said and, and uh, many times before, and I do agree, is an, is an opportunity to en enhance and protect uh, capital value. Um, uh, not looking at the ESG is just putting you... Um, on the opposite uh, side and in, in danger of, of losing value. Uh, ESG is, is um, not only um, a very relevant, uh, increasingly relevant on the, on the, uh, on the uh, borrower's side, but also on the lender side. We, uh, uh, we as a lender will be obliged by the, by the European um, guidelines to um, assess ESG risks, not only on the asset side, but also on the client side. Is the client compliant with all the ESG criteria, etc.? That will influence the internal rating of, of each uh, of each uh, um, transaction, and that will influence the, the 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 funding price, and maybe even determine whether or not we will we will um, go into that transaction or not. So the, is this is a is a is a factor which will um, uh, will we see increasing importance and increasing effects in in values in in capital protection etc so um as a, uh, it is maybe still difficult to factor in the esg uh, fundamentals into a purchase price it will be become very clear in the in the near future and uh, um and uh, at some point i think that lenders just will not in in, in terms of uh, uh, capital exposure will not be able to 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 fund buildings um, uh, commercial buildings that were not uh, uh, that, that you cannot turn into a green building so and, and, and maybe a second point I want to make is that uh, I want to underline what has been said before because I think that is a very important issue the the battle for climate change in real estate is is in the within the transformation of existing buildings uh, first of all, it makes the the eighty percent of the buildings that we will be looking at uh, in uh, twenty fifty. That's the the first one, and the second one is I, I agree with with um, somebody just said that before that uh, um, uh, build, <laughs> building new buildings is is consuming, uh, and we haven't factored in correctly, in my view. Yet uh, the uh, CO2 consumption of these of these resources. So, um, is it better to to refurbish and to transform a, an existing building versus building a new brand new certi certified uh, uh, new office building? Yes, I think it is better to transform the existing buildings. Better for our, our climate. It's better for our environment. So that's the that's the view we take on ESG. Okay, great. Um, we've got around 15 minutes left, so um, if you've got any questions, please do put those into the chat or the Q&A and we'll pick them up. Um, interesting, your comment, Michael, um, thanks very much for that, which is in terms of the office discussion we were having, um, that hubs might be an option for public administrations um, who don't have to contact clients so much. Um, so there may be, you know, an impact for, for cities like Berlin. Interesting point. Thanks for that. Um, and I wanted to pick up a little bit on um, Andy, given that you're based there in Paris. Um, we heard a little bit from from Jessica about um, the position there in, in the UK. Um, what are you seeing at the moment, particularly in the French market and, and the Paris market? So I don't know about the market, but the sentiment here has been 
quite optimistic in the last month since restaurants and bars opened. Simple thing, simple human thing. But there's a real surge of optimism in the air and that is shining the light on changes, the things that have been talked about, the role of the city and indeed is Paris what it always used to be in terms of the place to be. So there are stories of flats in the 15th arrondissement in very nice places which are now suddenly much slower to let. There are stories of exodus to towns in Normandy. Um, there was a giant exodus from the Paris area during COVID. And what does that mean? Are we in for a donut effect where the centre gets hollowed out? People have forgotten the habit of coming in, eating out, going out, and will stick in the suburbs. I don't actually believe that. I think that the the de-urbanisation thing is a myth, and that particularly young people, young, dynamic, talented people need the city, want the city. They don't want to live in Lisieux in Normandy. So what I see on, on the street is a really healthy buzz. Market-wise, there's clearly a significant question over the office sector, remembering that Paris, the market really is about you know, the office sector and it's 50 million square meters of stock. It's, it's three quarters or two thirds of the market. And in La Défense, there are real challenges. In the city center, much less, but here, you know, we do have to adapt ourselves. So, I mean, the, the view from Paris, Richard, is a positive one. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, I wanted to drill down into some of the sectors in the in the time we've got left. Um, Irina, just just coming to you in terms of the the retail side, um, what are you seeing there? Um, a really much a mixed bag. I think we've seen, you know, a negative performance of retail for I think nine consecutive quarters now. So if you look at the pan-European index, that hasn't changed. Uh, but I think we really need to unpick that uh, because there's a lot of dispersion in performance um, in retail, but across other markets, sectors, geographies. But I think in retail in particular, in terms of different segments of retail, you know, with the shopping centers uh, really in bad position because you have a structural headwinds from e-commerce, um, affordability issues, uh, you know, challenged business models, uh, which have been there before COVID and now been accelerated and really uh, putting them in a put position. But if you look at the other segments of retail, particularly the ones which are more affordable, uh, you know, more resilient to COVID closures, uh, like the staple, uh, you know, food, and maybe to some extent DIY and so on, they performed uh, really well uh, because of that stable income component. So I think uh, in the current market environment and be it retail, be it offices, I think if you, you know, have a clear vision of what the moving parts are and have a clear strategy how to unpick, you can really find opportunities, uh, particularly uh, because of where the pricing is at. Uh, for retail and I think there will be some repurposing and repositioning in that segment, a uh, significant one too. And does anybody see any kind of positive side? I mean there's a there's a sort of you know view of you know groceries obviously performing well. Um, is there is there a positive view from anybody in terms of the shopping centre side? Does anybody see a bounce back there? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think in, the silence is probably it's yeah. all gone quiet. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think um, you know, from our perspective, I think we still see retail as very much a value add play. Um, it would not appropriate to be acquiring for our core products, actually. And I can't remember who said it in the, previously. You know, what has happened since GFC has there been anything you know amazing or dramatic happening? I think the retail sector is absolutely that. I mean, I I cannot imagine now. 
um, choosing going into a shop versus buying something online. Whereas a decade ago, I'd be going into a shop rather than going online. And I know I'm in the UK and we're the uh, the, the largest exposure to uh, and usage of online shopping. But it, you know, it has been absolutely revolutionary. I think what has happened to the to the retail channels. And so, you know, we really we still have short term concerns around the sector. Um, both in the UK, which has had a, a huge amount of correction already within its rents and its yields, um, but also within continental Europe. And so um, certainly for us, we, we see that as a high risk play, possibly get to get your return, but maybe not in the short term. I'd, I'd, back, I'd back Jessica on that. Uh, in the U if, if the UK is anything to go by for the continent, there's still a path of, uh, path of correction to go on the continent. Now, it doesn't have to be as extreme. Uh, but the pressure is certainly on for the continent to to adapt. And again, the continent is notoriously slow in adapting valuation to, to market conditions. Uh, there's always that time lag. And I think, um, and there's the time lag. And then if, you, if you're if you honest, you could probably buy just about any shopping center at the moment. The willingness to sell. Yeah? So that elastic piece in the background will keep yields, you know, uh, the pressure on, 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 on yields moving outward uh, up for quite a while. And the biggest challenge indeed, especially by shopping centers, is getting your head around the future income stream. Uh, who will go in to re-energize these shopping centers? Uh, and you know, whatever I idea we've discussed so far, uh, they're all great concepts out there. And I think there's a reason, just like cities and high street, but they all come at a lower rental point. Uh, these more um, experimental, um, you know, more for the experience driven tenants uh, do not have the same capacities as the old retailers who are actually making money per square meter on that space. And that's simply not there in that same equation anymore. So there's some, some, some definite some movement there. Even though I have to say we have, ex you know, we have bought to extend our, uh, on some of the shopping centers that we truly believe in. We've bought, you know, the extension sites. Uh, we've looked at some, uh, some bits and pieces here. Um, and I do, if there has been a correction, I think High Street could have, you know, a good play here or there, simply because the land value is just that stabilizing factor in those locations uh, for the big, big cities. But shopping centers, I couldn't agree more, Jessica. You say value add, I probably look at it more opt opportunistically <laughs> at the moment still, because any refurb situation, I, I haven't seen you know, you really need a partner with superb expertise and track record to repurpose a shopping center into something different. Uh, it re that's, a, I mean, that's King's discipline. You know, that is really challenging. And, you know, the equity cuts that you need from the seller to be able to do that, they're not there yet. Yeah, and it's usually those centers that are actually still on the fringe of actually doing okay. Uh, so it's more obsolescence or, uh, um, or continuing with the use. It's a tough one, but... Um, no, not, not there yet. But um, yeah. may, may, I, may I ask a question to whoever is willing to answer that? Um, uh, even though we as a lender are quite cautious when it comes to shopping centers, obviously, because we don't participate in, in upsides, we only see the risks. So that um, gives us a, a, a quite a different perspective. However, um, I'm asking myself, isn't there a, a lot of correction of the values in, in shopping centers already done? When, when we talk, when we look at the stock prices of, of the big actors, when we look at uh, um, also the series of, of, uh, of uh, tenants uh, groups that have gone bust and that are out of the market, when we look at uh, uh, saving, uh, savings in the, in the big economies in, in, in uh, Europe, which has gone up by six, seven, eight percent, um, uh, it really gives a sentiment that a lot of the correction has already taken place maybe and that there is a lot of uh, consumer um, money uh, out there uh, waiting to, to be spent to go back into the in, in, into uh, physical uh, shops what do you make of that oh, I, I think, think of it that the shopping centers and the rest so I think as investors we're far more likely to head to retail warehousing to high streets before we head to a product that's got a roof on it and feels a little bit COVID insecure and people's muscle memory from that is is I think going to last. That said, I was in Quatretons La Défense last week and it was humming. Mm. So it's, there's no one answer, but I do see that con concurring with Jessica value add play, 
I agree with that completely. But um, grocery retail should be something that people are actively investing in in the core space before too long. I think there's plenty hunting out there right now for the long leases. But it comes back to you know, how easy is it to replicate and planning laws. So it's my take. But I think maybe, maybe the, the correction in the UK down. has already been is at 40 to 50 percent. The continent has not corrected its pricing deal by deal by 40 or 50 percent. To answer your question, it should go that direction and it will, but it takes notoriously long. Um, just look at who owns the big shopping centers. Yeah, it's your unions, your euro shop, it's your, your listed companies. Their interest in revaluing is pretty limited. Um, and they take a longer term view. So it's going to be a while until that value falls uh, and it starts uh, hitting your debt. Uh, so there's still a, you still rest rest uh, for another 12 months at least um, before and, it and Marcus, scraping, into your, uh, scraping into your senior debt position. And, and Marcus, you wanted to pick up on that point. I, I think at the end, we've seen a lot of adjustment, especially if you look at capital values, for instance, in the UK less so in continental Europe. But I think the ultimate question that we are still out to be answered is an affordability question we often only talk about in resi, but it's the affordability for the retailer when it comes to high sure. street and shopping center. Uh, given the competition from online, given the changing role of the store, the store will always be there, but the role of the store is different. And therefore also the ability to pay for that store on the retail side is changing. So the affordability of rent levels in the retail segment is, I think, the big, big open question. We all uh, have not a, a real answer yet, but we are just in, uh, trying to work out what are the future sustainable rent levels that, that retailers can afford. But ultimately, if we believe in cities, there will be space for high street retail and for certain shopping centers, maybe not for all we have now. The only question is, how can they adapt to the new city fabric? But there is obsolescence there as well, Marcus. I mean, that's the point. I think the, the high streets in the bigger cities will reduce in size. Yeah? Yeah. The need isn't as broad. You will have the main streets and with relatively stable values and, and rents potentially. Again, bifurcation of tenant demand will drive your values in high street and potentially drive your values in the one or other shopping center as well. But it's a question of obsolescence. You will not have the B location high street, just like, and that's the bigger social challenge, What's going to happen with these C and D cities that you can already see in the UK with no high street? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a dereliction of those locations, uh, which again drives your urbanization of your bigger centers again. Now, um, so there's you know there's a social element here that that I find quite worrying to tell you the truth of what what these smaller towns um, and the fall away of tenants uh, will will implicate and what that means for movement social movement. Uh, and social equality as well. So, you know, there's, there's, there's some food for thought in that. Okay, good. We've only got around two minutes left, sadly. This, is, this hour has gone extremely quickly. Um, so I just wanted to pick up with everybody just in terms of where you're seeing the, the opportunities at the moment when you look forward um, in terms of either sectors or, or cities or um, what that would be. And also this is uh, either for... Um, but Asem or, or Philip from the debt side, if you want to pick up a question, coming from uh, Michael Spurk at, um, Michael Spark, uh, brother, which is so far we've seen significant negative screening of brown projects in terms of financing. Do you see a potential of positive screening with green projects will actually be offered with lower margins or being green simply becomes a necessity for the financing itself? So if anybody can pick that up very briefly as well in their final comments, that would be great. Let's start with you, Asem. Yeah, well, uh, picking up that question very clearly, we've we've uh, we've it was been quite a while now that we're offering uh, discount on margins for green products. So um, yes, we are um, re uh, operating with reduced margin when it comes to to, to green uh, green building. In terms of um, opportunities, of course, I I, I think uh, um, it's a fantastic opportunity, and many have seized that opportunity to switch from commercial real estate into residential real estate. Of course, as a Berliner and, and Berlin based, I will always make a, um, a little bit marketing for my home city, which is Berlin, uh, still has some uh, fabulous uh, growth opportunities. But uh, elsewhere, in, in I, I see that, that uh, uh, residential real estate is back on the radar screen in, 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 in Paris.
Paris, for example, and and so you know, that's a that's a that, that's a that's a good uh, evolution, um, and uh, I think office will, um, and in particular qualitative office, will remain the uh, a core business in in real estate, and it remains very attractive. But having said this, also maybe a final um, remark on that. Also, the quarters have to evolve. So, um, La Défense has been mentioned by Andy, and, and I think La Défense is one of the the, the big um, laboratories which we'll see where, how uh, business districts will have to evolve. Great, thanks very much. Um, Jessica, what's, what's your view on the opportunities? Yep, so from a hierarchy of risk return, I think residential still is an outperformer there amongst the other sectors for the for the next few years. So we'll continue to grow our AUM there. And I think my only um, comment on residential, because we talk about pricing, is that you need to have wide coverage across Europe and be able to go to first and second tier cities to get the returns out of that sector. So you need an asset manager that can do that. OK, <laughs> Andy. Yeah, uh, Resi is my pick. Um, I'm going to help Asim with his marketing project. Uh, we have just bought a couple of buildings in good old West Berlin, a couple of residential buildings. Um, the other in that sector is Copenhagen, uh, where my core fund has bought five PRS assets this year and the performance has been spectacularly good. Um, and as a related topic to Copenhagen, my value add colleagues have just done a 45 million euro deal in senior living in Copenhagen. Uh, we haven't had the time to get round to that, but that particular sector, I feel strongly, has moved fast up the menu in the last six months. Great, and senior living is something where we'll be doing another session on that probably before the summer for certain. Um, Marcus. Yeah, I think uh, the living alternatives have been talked a lot now. Also, Andy mentioned some of them. I think that have been in the past uh, uh, an interesting play and they continue to be. But also, I think there are other niches in the logistics sector emerging where, where opportunities are there. And also, there is a lot of talk about uh, niche alternatives. You compare Europe with the US and what you see there in, in, in the REIT segment, how many alternative sectors are have there emerged over the past 10 years. And don't think Europe will replicate all this one on one, but I think there are enough of niche alternatives that 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 will will develop over the coming years, and we will see, for instance, logistic de develop a much broader, de more detailed, more faceted business that offers a lot of opportunities by repricing in in the, between the different subsectors. Great, thanks very much. And that <clears throat> and that um, that alternative side has been really interesting. And I know you've been you've been tracking that as well, Irina. Um, what's what's your kind of view on the uh, on the opportunities? I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think I don't want to uh, echo uh, the sector angle, so I think I approach it slightly differently. Uh, I think one big shift that we are seeing is uh, looking at real estate as a user centric strategy. So a shift from real estate as a product to real estate as a product with the service going all the way to hotelization. And I think that's where, uh, you know, the first mover advantage can be taken because effectively you can generate additional uh, income streams from services. You can enhance um, uh, rents as well. And uh, we are working and about to launch a paper on the topic next week. So please read up on that. And from the other point of view, I think as an industry, we tend to focus on the rents um, and income coming in from that. I think time is now also to think about costs, because I think reduction of costs made through new technology, energy efficiency or building scale to run the portfolio will add to performance. And I think that's an opportunity there. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. And last but very much not least, Philip. Yeah, I'm still reeling from the recognition that we just bought Resi in Copenhagen and Berlin as well. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing that we are doing the same thing as Europa or Andy. 
maybe Andy, your your DNA is still stuck with Lestal. Uh, it seems that we're still kind of thinking this <laughs> down the same down the same path. Um, um, look, if you look at it from a core perspective for a core core plus funds, yes, jet beds and meds is still is still in the mix. That's also driven by the fact that we've had just a large office exposure in the past. The typical European uh, you know, portfolio structure will have 60, 70 percent offices, and we're trying to counter uh, move that or, or or try to improve our portfolio structure by going deeper into into resi in particular and logistics. So we've been doing that for the for the majority of the year. We're looking at some more presently in Berlin as well. Um, so yes, I, I agree with that strategy. On the value creation side, that's the more challenging piece. Um, and we're keeping a close look on retail at the moment just to see where are those corrections, where are the angles to move into that space. Um, I also believe that in reconstruction and or new build, and I agree with what has been said before, if you can, you refurb, you don't build new. Uh, but playing the ESG in confluent areas, I like as well. And I think the residential piece, looking at second and third tier cities uh, to gain access to that uh, return, as Jessica already mentioned, I like that play as well. And I have to say, but we didn't touch on it at all, uh, we are buying our first hotel again. Um, and depending on your operator, your city, and where that use leans, is it business or tourism? And I would promote tourism as the first return back because I'm a bit iffy on how business will come back, and it's certainly not going to hit the 19 or the 2019 levels fast. Yeah, that's going to take a while for those uh, to come back. I think hotels have a have an attractive element as well. And if I could, I would buy data centers in Norway all day long with the right operator, but it's just extremely difficult to access. And it's a very limited market, but it's a superb uh, asset class if done right. Uh, and, and not very ESG friendly, by the way, because uh, their energy consumption is huge. Uh, but it's obviously, it's, you know, our hold back on the fourth revolution of uh, that we're in the midst of uh, the technological revolution, data centers and the supply of them is holding back further innovations. So the demand is endless for more capacity uh, here. So, but you need the right operator, the right location, and it's all driven by energy costs. So that would be great, but difficult to access. Great, thanks very much. Really interesting, really interesting discussion there. Um, thanks very much for um, for your questions as well. And interestingly, linking to that, um, the data centers topic as well, um, and the and the requirement for energy, which you're absolutely right, Philip, is huge for those. Um, we've actually on Thursday morning uh, at the same time we've um, we're running a, an infrastructure summit, looking at new energy and sustainable energy, particularly that wind and wave. Um, one which I think will support some of those data centers, um, which will be really interesting. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, do join us. Um, you mentioned there as well um, hotels, Philip. Um, and in fact, if you if when you're in the auditorium um, after this, um, if you're in the Relax Auditorium, you can click on On Demand and there you'll be able to see the um, the hotel session um, that we recently ran just at the end of last week. Um, but, but absolutely, Philip, what you were saying there just picks up on that. And there was a lot of optimism there about particularly a bounce back in terms of the leisure side. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, really interesting discussion. Thanks very much to all of the speakers for all of your insights. Um, Thanks very much for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks very much, everybody.